I was gonna try and sing with a guitar, but I think the acoustics in here um, won't work. So, so I'm gonna go out and pedal. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I get this. Um, a, a lot of people, a lot of people in Florida, or people who have moved to Florida, they, they always come to this state and they're like, nothing grows here. This is horrible. Like I literally killed everything in my yard. It's like, and I bet you didn't kill everything in your yard because you still have a uh, Brazilian pepper over there, and there's a uh, camphor tree right there. There's a mimosa. Something grows here. There's actually a lot of stuff that grows in Florida. There are very few places in Florida where it isn't actually green. There's there's green stuff everywhere. Our problem is that it's not the green stuff that we're used to, or the green stuff we actually want to grow. So my topic today is making the best of terrible soil. How can you take terrible soil and still get a yield? And I'm particularly going to focus on feeding yourself. The primary goal of gardening should really be to feed yourself. I have gotten in a lot of uh, arguments with with people that I, I that are, are well intentioned, but I would call it the endless purity spiral. It has to be organic. It has to be non-hybrid. It has to be done like this, and it's got to be in a box like this, and it's got to be a spacing like this, and you've got to do it like this, like this, like this, like this. And, and you think that when you get to the other end of the spectrum and you look at the, the permaculture people, right? You got like some hippie down in Costa Rica and he's like, yeah, so like I eat the leaves of this tree like every day. And um, like I feel so like, like the vitality is amazing. And, and you look at this guy and you're like, well, this guy, he, like, he's like a hippie, right? He just basically lives in the jungle and does his stuff. And then he's like, so we made this plan and then he pulls out this gigantic architectural drawing. Okay, like on the southwest over there, you're gonna put your bananas and plantains because you wanna capture the maximum amount of solar energy coming across here, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna back that up right behind there. You, if you wanted to put in a pecan tree or something, you would do that, but you've gotta make sure that the water table is gonna be accepting of that. And then you're gonna, and you start going, oh my gosh. Like, is there any way that we can actually just grow food do we, are we really stuck with these systems? Or, I, I was reading an, an article the other day on this website, uh, Natural News, the website, some of you guys probably know it. It's, it's always, if you, know, if you never want to sleep again, go read Natural News. <laughs> they're trying to kill us. 15 ways they're trying to kill us right now. Um, but anyhow, there was, there was an article and he said, you know, it's really important that we grow our own food. I'm like, yes, it's definitely important that we grow our own food. So you need to look into this, this aquaponics method of growing vegetables, you know, in, in a certain recirculating water tank complex. I'm like, no, 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 look. Our ancestors grew food in dirt. They had a hoe, they had a shovel, maybe, I read a book called Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. Has anybody read that book? Any, anybody that nerdy? Okay, so in 1915, there was a, a young man who was doing research on an Indian tribe up in the, the, the Midwest. And he decided to interview this woman about their agricultural practices before the whites came, before they got settled onto plantations, before everything got shifted and changed and they switched crops and they switched methods and that sort of thing. So he interviews this woman and they used to, she says, well, before the white man came, we used to take the shoulder bone of a deer and we would use it to scrape the soil. And we did this, and we did this. And they're basically, they had, a, they had a stick. They would cultivate the ground with a stick. Stick it in there, work a little piece of the ground up, and then drop a couple of corn seeds. And they go stick a stick in the ground and work a piece. You don't need to have a recirculating pump, a solar panel, a bell valves, PVC, a giant fish tank, and a degree in chemistry uh, in order to grow food. 
What you have to actually do is work with the system, work with the way God designed this particular area to work. There are plenty of plants that grow really, really well in this area. We grow in Florida, and this, this applies to any area. We, you have different geological areas with different things that grow in those areas well. This is why Georgia is known for peanuts, sweet potatoes, pecans, cotton, right? All this stuff, we know this area for these things. Wisconsin, what do we know Wisconsin for? Cheese. They have this beautiful pasture land, rich soils, perennial grasses, glacial remains, right? So it's perfect for raising nice big fat cows. Different areas have different, different things that grow well in them. And you get so you can start to recognize, oh, this would be good for this, just by looking at the area around. So if you see pines, can anybody tell me what good edible usually grows around pines? Blueberries, blackberries, and all the various relatives of them. People will say, oh, that's a, that's a huckleberry, that's a dewberry, that's a whatever berry, and they have all these crazy names. It's basically different types of things that shred your, your legs when you walk through them. So it's, it's um, Beria lexredia in Latin. The, there's a whole group of them. But they like acid soil, they don't mind, they like being around the pines, they get mulched by the pines. We have got wild rabbit eye blueberries all over my property, which is just over the border into Alabama. And we also have Yapon holly. Yapon holly is really, really common. It has a very bad name. In Latin, it is Ilex vomitoria, the vomiting holly. And I believe that this was a conspiracy by the tea companies to ruin this plant. They gave it this name because apparently when the Spanish showed up and the Spanish, the Indians invited them to a party and the Indians were like, hey, you know, why don't you come out? We'll, we'll do some like Indian stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, that's cool. And then we guess we'll conquer you later. Okay, that's cool. Um, so they have this big, they have this big party and they brewed up a bunch of tea, real strong tea from the Yapon Holly and they drank it, and they drank gallons of it and vomited all over the place after jumping around and having a great time. Well, the tree has a lot of caffeine in it. It is a native North American source of caffeine. So if you were to go and drink, I don't know, 32, 64 ounces of tea, it would start to feel a little weird, and if you kept doing that, and you know, it, you, you throw up. Just like if you overindulge in just about anything else. But then this poor tree gets given this name, which is very unfair, because I made tea out of it, and after I finished vomiting, I felt great. <laughs> I felt you know, invigorated. Uh, no, it, it's, it, it won't make you sick. As a matter of fact, there is a, uh, there's a tea company in Texas that they make and sell tea out of it, but it was a local, easy to grow plant that met a specific niche. We want our tea or our coffee because otherwise life isn't worth living. So there's this tea that grows right here, but guess what? There are tea companies that would rather have you buy tea from China, India, etc., so on and so forth. And so sometimes it's deliberate where you, you know, something is not really all that popular because it's, um, it's just not well known. And sometimes something is banned because it's actually getting to be known and there's an economic reason to not have it. But in the case of, uh, in the case of Yopan tea, there is a native tea, it tastes just like regular green tea, it's delicious. You toast the little leaves and you can get a darker tea out of it, nice smoky flavor. Um, there's all kinds of stuff like that. And so the first thing you do is you look around and say, okay, not what crazy complicated system did I see on YouTube? What looks like it's a brand new way to grow food? Like, what if, what if we took a big chunk of styrofoam and we floated it in a pool, and then like in the pool we would put some minerals, 
and then we could raise catfish in the pool, and then we could like plant trees in there, and then we could hang chicken cages in the trees, and they would like fertilize the water. You know, look at some of these systems. I'm like, okay, well that's cool, but but did you ever meet like a computer geek? And they're like, it's really easy. Once you install the kernel, you're just gonna go back and you're gonna hit sudo slash m football. You gotta make sure that you're booted in safe mode first because, you know, and then and you start, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not complicated. I, I had a friend that used to tell me, get a Linux computer. You should get Linux. And I'm like looking at his Linux and, 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 and he's like, you could do anything with it. But yeah, that is if you know how to write computer languages, sure. I, I also had an uncle that would fix Volkswagen bugs just for fun. He had Volkswagen bugs and he had parts spread all over his yard and there was always a bug that was half broken and getting rebuilt. Okay, that's great if you like to do it. There is an engineering mindset that loves the challenge and the idea of doing so. I don't want to scratch at the dirt with a stick. I want science. I want something really complicated and awesome and cool that nobody's ever done before and it's like so space age. But the more complicated you get, the more potential for failure you have. I had multiple friends with aquaponic systems which generally they were either dealing with dead fish or yellow lettuce most of the time. It's not that it can't work because there are definitely companies. You go up to some place, you know, some place in the Midwest warehouse district. Somebody wants to do a, a fresh garden greens type of a system. So they have a whole hydroponics or aquaponics system with expensive tanks and, and artificial light and all that kind of stuff. And they could grow year round and sell to the market and it really works. But you have to be willing to be a total engineer and to be willing to work at broken systems and stuff. When a poor person in the third world that can't read and write and is missing a couple of teeth and has basically never left the mountainside, can grow food with a couple of simple tools, you can do it in your backyard. It's surprising how complicated we like to make things rather than just, just simply saying, okay, how did people used to do it? Almost every area in Florida at one point had some agricultural use that we can look back on and say, oh yeah, they used to grow this, they used to grow this, they used to grow this. You know those little citron melons? I don't know if anybody's seen those. They're, they're an occasional weed of Florida. It's like a little wild watermelon. Somebody at some point planted them. They're really good for pectin. They used to be used when you added them to canning recipes to get your jelly to set up and make a jam set up really nicely. They grow all over the place. People used to know what they are, but now it's just like, oh, it's just that weird kind of like fake watermelon thing. And we go out and we buy pectin. It's probably, it could be like in your backyard. There were very, very simple systems. So you're starting with poor soil. So a few years ago, I wrote a book called Totally Crazy Easy Florida Gardening. And and, and I've had people say, okay, how did you get to be such a good gardener? And I said, well, the way I got to be a very good gardener was I killed lots of things. I have so much chlorophyll on my hands. I am a plant genocider. Because I wanted to grow food. I liked gardening, but I'm also busy. I was, when I was doing a lot of that research, I was working as a freelancer, I was writing scripts for radio, I was editing audio for people, I was doing all this kind of work to try and stay ahead. At one point I was painting houses. I was doing whatever I could to feed the family and keep going, and I was gardening in the backyard. And so, the plants had to be robust enough where I didn't have to babysit it. Um, they had to live. And from the time I was very little, I was kind of scatterbrained as well. So sometimes I'd forget to water things, or I'd plant things in the backyard, and I wouldn't quite get around to it. I'm like, oh shoot, yeah, I should have probably watered that. You know, um, that's why my parents didn't let me have pets, usually. But from that, planting different things and then seeing which things lived, you start to learn which things you plant again. So, say if you wanted to grow tomatoes in Florida, 
I, I, tomatoes are what every gardener wants to grow, but tomatoes are the biggest pain in the neck. In Florida, I've had people write me from up north and say, I don't know why you say tomatoes are so difficult. I grow tomatoes every year. We harvested 15,000 pounds this year, and I'm just letting the rest rot. It's like, okay, well, that's great, but your area is made for tomatoes. I'll tell you what I grew in my backyard. Mosquitoes. <laughs> no, I, I grew a massive amount this year of, I grew seminal pumpkins. It's an old Florida variety of pumpkin. It is an heirloom pumpkin. And it was, it may have been bred on purpose or it may have been bred on accident because the natives in Florida were planting them here and there and they would wander from place to place and they would plant little patches of things and then they would go someplace else and then they would come back later and harvest stuff when it was around. So instead of being on top of it and babying it all the time, like if you raise a Cornish cross chicken, they're constantly hungry, they constantly need water, they can't defend themselves, they grow really fast, they get morbidly obese, and then you eat them. And that's like their whole life. But I was talking to a guy this last week who has been collecting old varieties of chickens from way back when, and he said, these chickens, I don't even lock them up. They, don't even, they can defend themselves from predators. They live up in the trees. I stick a couple of nest boxes around the yard. Occasionally they lay eggs for me, and when I want a chicken, I can go shoot one. Like, wow, that's different. It's a different way to think about it. And so if you wanted to grow a really good tomato in Florida, you would look and see, okay, what did my neighbor grow that worked? There's a first place to start. I start with my neighbor. If I see any neighbors that know how to garden, I say, what grew well for you? And they'll say, well, I tried this and I didn't do real well. A couple of years ago, we had a huge amount of those, so I decided I was tired of those and I didn't grow them anymore. And now I grow these, these always do really well. I do this, I do this, I do this. Basically, you've just downloaded all of that information that that person has learned about the soil in your neighborhood already and put it into your head. So now you have a little bit of regional information. And then you go a little bit further out and you say, okay, what did they used to grow? Was there a agricultural commodity that grew in this area? Grain corn? You know, did they grow pumpkins here? Did they grow tomatoes here? Did they grow, what did they grow? They grow pecans? Maybe you're in one of those areas where you've got pine scrub and you've got yellowy looking palmettos underneath the pines and pretty much the only thing you grow is, is rattlesnakes. Now that, those areas, they often just kind of ran bush animals through and you know run cows through and the cows probably weren't even that happy with it but they figured out well you can put a turpentine industry out here because pines grow real well pines aren't food so what grows with the pines well blueberries for starters i'm gonna plant myself some blueberries and then maybe you trade the blueberries to somebody that's got something that's a little bit better but coming back to the pumpkin the pumpkin was possibly an accidental pumpkin the Seminole pumpkin got named after the Seminole Indian tribe, which was later chased down into Florida. They weren't really a native tribe originally. They kind of ended up in Florida as the federal government expanded and took over more land. But they would plant these pumpkins and they would move from place to place and they would come back and do the same thing. And, the, and I have heard that there are still occasional populations of these pumpkins growing wild in the woods. And you can occasionally find a pumpkin growing out there in the Everglades. That's pretty cool. So, we get it in our head, like, I want to grow pumpkins or winter squash. So you look at the seed catalog, and there's all these pictures. Anybody read the Baker Creek seed catalog? That will mess with your head. I want to wear suspenders when I read that catalog. It's like the only time, suspenders. Um, but you look at all these pretty stuff, and how do we pick it? Well. Well, it says it tastes real good, and it and it looks like a, it looks like some sort of weird planet. I like that, and I want that one that has the stripes. Well, it's it's a it's a start. You can try it, but it's basically it, it's gambling. Where is Baker Creek Seeds located? Anybody? Missouri. How similar do you think the climate is in Missouri and Florida? 
Here's another great seed company, Johnny's Selected Seeds. Johnny Selected Seeds has some of the highest germination rates. They provide seeds for uh, farmers, particularly small farmers all over the country. They have, they have standards that are head and shoulders above everybody else's. They're in Maine. The way I find foods that grow well in Florida is I consult the invasive species guides from the University of Florida. Not seriously, but kind of seriously. If you grow plants that don't mind the sand, don't mind the heat, don't mind the bugs, that are, that are half wild already, you will have success. If you try to transplant, like if you were to take somebody from Canada, A, eh, and you drop them here like in the middle of summer and say, hey, come help me dig my garden, you would kill a Canadian. And it's not very charitable. Likewise, if I decided to go up to Canada for winter, I would die. I would go outside and probably just just fall over dead. It would be done. I would be done. I don't know how to live up there. I went to Tennessee. First time I ever saw snow. When I was 24, I took a job up there. My windshield froze over. It took me like 30 minutes to figure out how to get to work because I couldn't see through the winter. I'm like, how do they do this? I go inside, I get a spatula. You know, I was like, D I could get, I could get the hair dryer, I guess, and I was trying to stuff. I find out they have a tool for that. It's a scraper thing. If you don't plant what what likes the soil, first of all, it is an uphill battle. Your level of expertise has to be up here to grow, say, beefsteak tomatoes in Florida. You want to grow Brussels sprouts? I can't grow Brussels sprouts. I keep trying to grow Brussels sprouts. I love them. They need a real long season. They don't like me. Somebody here probably knows how to grow Brussels sprouts. Maybe we should have the next talk on Brussels sprouts, but I would like to hear it. Um, it's frustrating. I want to grow dry beans. I like the idea of growing soup beans, right? The civilization collapses. I don't just have to store beans. Oh, no. Oh, no. I got beans in my garden. I got all my kids at the table shelling them. Look at this. Three hours we can have soup. You know, I love the idea. It's cool, and, and they look cool. I mean, there's ones with spots and stripes and stuff. I kept trying beans in Florida to try and get dry beans. The only dry bean I had six really be somewhat successful for me was black eyed pea. Well, isn't that interesting? that every southern dish has black-eyed peas in it. Pretty much, I mean, you're just gonna take that pig and stuff him with black-eyed peas, put a coat down his throat, you know. I mean, it's it's like black-eyed peas, it's, it's a standard southern staple. We don't eat runner beans, usually. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, runner beans, you should try runner beans. Well, I tried runner beans. They didn't like it. I got moldy little beans in pods. I only got a few pods. And I heard all these things about, oh, they're so productive and they're perennial. They come back year after year. No. Collards. Collards. Collards don't mind growing. They don't care. They're just like, oh, yeah, man. I don't care that it's hot. I don't care. They don't care if it freezes. They don't care if it's hot. They don't care if you eat them. <laughs> they just sit around on trucks like, all right, yeah. Um, they grow real well here. There is a yam. Everybody, I always talk about this yam. I know, those of you that know me, Dioscoria alata. Dioscoria alata is called the water yam, or the greater yam. It's not a sweet potato. It's not even related to sweet potatoes. It's not even in the broader plant family. It's a monocot. A monocot, not a dicot. So, it is, it is so completely different from sweet potatoes, but if you say yam, well, that's a marketing thing. It's a, oh, it's a yam. It's like those, those sweet orange things that come in cans. No, this is, a, this is a big white root like this. Down in the Caribbean where we were, people used to dig them out of the woods. When they would die back in the fall, the vines would die back, and people would dig them out with machetes, particularly people 
that were poor, they would go up on the mountainsides and they would dig them out of the hillsides. They just were all over the place. And they'd come back with this great big root. And that's about 8,000 calories of carbohydrates right there. And it's pretty much like a white potato. Chop it into pieces, boil it. You know, it's, it's not fancy. It doesn't taste amazing, but it doesn't taste bad. It's just kind of a, that'll keep you alive. And it's not bad. Make real nice mashed potatoes with butter and some heavy cream. You know, that's good. In Florida, they are listed as a class one non-native invasive species because they actually grow well here. They grow so well that if they end up in the woods, they just continue to grow. They have a relative that's known as the air potato. Everybody knows the air potato. The air potato, I planted a lot of those when I was a kid because they would grow on the fence of our church. So on the break in church, we would take sticks and we would throw them in the air and we would whack these roots. These little roots would hang on the vines. They're a ball about that big, a hard little root. When the vine dies back in the fall, those little roots fall over the ground. Every one of them can turn into a new plant. They can climb 50 feet, 60 feet up into trees. And then when the fall comes, there's all these little roots hanging up there. And then they start just falling as the vines die back. And they'll plant the entire woods. They'll climb 40 feet, 60 feet, 40 feet, 60 feet, every year after year after year until they take over. But they're a super good survival root crop. And they have relatives that are not on the invasive species list that grow just as well. If you go down to the ethnic market or even to Publix, Publix usually carries them, you look for Name roots, N-A-M-E. It's a just a gray looking root, and it's one of those things where you go, what is that? I've never heard of that thing before. Why is it called name root? It's like they forget to put the name in there, and it's just name root. Like, we'll get around to naming your root later. Uh, no, it's Name, but it's just complicated. Um, just doesn't make sense to our to our English eyes. But if you take those, you can cut them up, dust them with ashes, plant them in poor soil, ignore them for two years, and then dig up roots that are like this big. After one year, they're usually about that big. The second year, they get really big. It's a perennial root crop. It regrows the root every year by taking the above ground growth, dies back, and becomes part of that root. And it is an unstoppable plant. How many, how many of you have grown uh, white potatoes? How well do they do for you? Anybody have like really great success with white potatoes? I've had so, so success. Like I've made enough potatoes to be like, oh, that's great that we have potatoes and they taste really good. I'll be like, I harvested 400 pounds of potatoes this year but I planted 150 pounds. So it's not like a huge yield. You know, if you plant a cabbage seed, right? One little tiny seed. You get cabbage that's this big. I plant one potato and I get like that much more potato. That's not great. But I planted yams. I plant a little piece of root that big and I get a root this big that grew underneath the dogwood tree where I ignored it. That's cool. That's cool. So, first of all, the first thing I would say is plant what works. And this may mean first you're asking your neighbors and then finding out what do the farmers grow around here. You can call the local extension office and say, hey, what do people grow around here? What do farmers grow here? What do you, what do you deal with crop-wise? And just start taking notes. Sometimes those extension agents are kind of bored anyways. They'll give you tons of information. I've just called extension agents in different states. Somebody asked me once, oh, what'll grow in the high desert of, of uh, somewhere out west? One of, those, one of those square states. And so I called the extension office and I said, hey, have you grown any fruit trees here? Does anybody grow fruit trees? And he starts telling me, oh, we've been doing some experiments with this and that, and somebody do this, and somebody did this, and da 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 Gives me all this info, and he goes, oh, there's a plant nursery guy. You should talk to this plant nursery guy. He's got da 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 So then I call the plant nursery guy, and the guy goes, oh, man, my family's been growing cherries here. For... He says, people don't know you can grow them, but you gotta do the blah, 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 and he gives you all this information. I'm just writing, writing, writing. 
I write this woman back, I said, here's what you can grow in your square state. It's just a matter of going, who has the knowledge? I don't, if I don't have it, there's somebody that's got it. It might be that old lady down the road. It might be that, that guy over there at the extension office. It might be that farmer in his 90s. Just sit and listen to people and say, what grew here? What did you grow? How did you eat growing up before everything came in plastic? It's getting harder and harder to find people like that. We've had a lot of convenient times for a long time. And the whole world works in cycles. And I think that we are coming into a down cycle again where things are going to get tougher. I think we're going to have to learn how to grow old, you know. We may not be able to look at the supply line stuff. Are you going to really count on being able to get a solar panel and PVC and rock wool and new tilapia spawn and whatever? I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, I can store seeds. I can store tools. I can even put bag fertilizer in the shed for a while. But I better know how to grow with the dirt that God gave us from, from the beginning, right? How did people used to do it when they were poor? How did you do it when you had to do it? Not when you're excited about learning something cool, you know, but if you have to do it. If you have to, I feel like jumping down and getting it's probably not a good idea. I don't think this is long enough. If you have to, grow, it's a totally different thing than if, you know, if you didn't have to grow. I, <laughs> I, said, I said the other day, I said, you know, you can grow right in the dirt. You realize you don't have to go to Home Depot first and buy wood. <laughs> you can actually just cut a spot in the ground and rough it up a little bit and plant it. Can you imagine? Can you, I said, do you ever go to one of those big farms? where they have like 15,000 four by eight pressure treated beds covering the entire hillside? No. No, because they have an economic reason not to do that. And if you're trying to grow your own food, you have an economic reason not to spend all the money. Don't get caught with like a fake easiness. There's always this like, if you just do it this way, it's gonna be really easy. So what I do is like glue together five gallon buckets and then I have this weight and, it, and it's like, okay, stop, just stop. I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna, that's weird. How does the guy who can't read feed himself? If I can start there, I have a beginning. Now, I like to use minerals to mineralize the soil. I like to buy kelp meal and uh, amendments like that for the soil. Because they're available right now, I will use them. But if I could not buy a mineral mix of micronutrients to feed my garden, I could still grow my garden. I know how to compost chicken manure, I know how to go out in the woods. You can go out there underneath the trees and rake up a bunch of stuff and put it through a sifter and use that for compost if you had to. You can go down to the Gulf and you can fill the back of your truck full of seaweed and get pretty much all the minerals you need for your compost. Every time you throw that in the compost pile, all those minerals of the ocean are gonna go into your garden. And you don't really have to worry about the salt all that much either because it rains so much here, the salt passes through. And if you do manage to grow tomatoes, having a little salt actually makes them taste better. They'll taste better if they have a little ocean water on them. So you go to, okay, I will use what I can when I have it, but it's really important to know the price of lumber, right? The price of lumber. If I want to build a raised bed, oh, that seemed like a good idea five years ago. But earlier this year, I'm going to take out a loan to grow radishes? This doesn't make any sense. Simple, simple, simple. So here's a couple of things you can do. If you, you, you already have Florida sand, here's how I would put in a, here's how I would put in a garden on bad soil. First I'd look around and say, okay, do I have any pines on this land? If there's a lot of pines, that's a sign that your soil is probably acid. So make a pile of wood, have your family over, Sing a few songs, roast some marshmallows, take those wood ashes from the fire that you made and spread them over that area. Now you just raise the pH a little bit, plus you added the nutrients that were in there, some calcium, 
some potassium. You take what you've already got there. You got that that's big, overgrown, ugly bush out front. Cut it up. Don't throw it by the side of the road. Burn it. Throw the ashes on there. And I found that you can do one better than that. I've been experimenting with chopping up brush, taking wood, burning it so it's halfway burned and it turns into charcoal, and then taking that charcoal and soaking it in mineral solutions. You can soak that charcoal in a mineral solution and it acts like a battery. And it sits there in the soil and it's rather like, but not exactly like, compost. It has a similar effect. Smash a bunch of charcoal up and till it in. But if you were to simply make a bunch of charcoal and then till it into the ground, that's not particularly good because it will soak up the nutrients that are in the ground, which is why you soak it up first. If you, if you ever get sick to your stomach, it's a good idea to have activated charcoal on hand. That's charcoal that's been treated so it has even more pore space. It will soak up what you eat. The guy that invented activated charcoal, by the way, to show how well it worked, he drank strychnine and ate activated charcoal to demonstrate to his scientific colleagues. I wish scientists did that sort of thing today. <laughs> put, some, put some skin in the game, boys. Anyhow, it acts like a battery. It soaks up the minerals. So if you dump it right in the soil, whatever limited nitrogen, etc., that you have in the ground gets soaked up and you'll get yellow plant growth and it doesn't look very good. But I found by soaking it first and then tilting it into the ground, it helped a lot. Now this is just, I'm just experimenting with it right now. But so far I have grown vegetables that are bigger and sweeter and the effect of the charcoal has at least worked for the first year. My long-term goal is to say, okay, well, will this keep working year after year after year? Or is this something that I'm gonna have to keep playing with? It seems like charcoal doesn't break down for a long time. There are ancient soils that have a lot of charcoal in it that are still good. There's still good soil after centuries. So i reasonably certain it's going to continue to work, but Florida is baffling sometimes. We get a lot of rain and a lot of, there's a lot of movement through the soil, a lot of leaching activity that takes place. So the question will be is, is do those batteries work for very long or do they continue? Do they soak up new nutrients as it washes through? Well, we'll find out. But the first thing you could do is tear up an area. If your soil is not loose, there are sometimes, sometimes you say, well, it's sandy. But if you try to dig it, if it's hard to dig it, you probably should loosen it up. Plant roots like to go down into the ground. The deeper they can go down in the ground, the, ground, the happier they are. If you want to grow in the most simple way possible, you loosen the area of ground up, and then you plant your plants wider than recommended. Most people don't want to do that because it feels like it's a waste of space. But if you have more space and less time, plant your plants a little wider. That way they don't fight for the nutrients and the water that is in the ground around their roots. Watermelon roots can spread eight feet down into the ground. You pull it up and you see this little cluster of roots. Those, there are root threads that break off, that go, they go really far, and they'll fight with each other. When you have crops in a row right on top of each other, it, it feels cruel to thin them out. But if you thin them out, they have less to fight over. Have you ever like had I don't know how many, well, let's see, who has, um, who has four children? Four children? Four children? Four? Six, well, I'm not up to you yet. Any five? Got any five? 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 Six? Six, There's, there we go. Six? Seven? Any sevens? We have a couple of sixes over here. Eight? No, nobody has eight kids? Nine? Ten? Oh, we're working on number ten, so I'm always curious. I want to see how weird I am. Um, but 
if you have a bunch of kids together, sometimes it's great. Well, they're all keeping each other company. But sometimes it's like, go outside. Get some space. You two are just, you two are always on top of each other. Particularly if you have kids that are right next to each other in age, right? They're real similar. They get on each other's nerves. That's not your coloring book. It is. He said I could have it. No, he, I don't think he did. Don't draw in it because those are my crayons. Stop. Stop. Go outside. Now. Outside. When the plants are all on top of each other, they need a little bit of breathing room. And we have basically, I think, been, been indoctrinated with a with an idea of let's have really tiny space. We're going to live in pods and eat bugs and we'll have two square feet of garden per person and, or maybe if we'll eat spirulina algae or something. So we have this idea of let's get the most out of a tiny little itty bitty space. So when you pack a bunch of plants into this, this space right here would grow one cabbage, top of this podium, one cabbage it would do pretty good. You put four cabbages in it, you better be out there watering them and feeding them a lot. Because here's a cabbage, the root system of the cabbage is going like this, sideways. Those roots run into the other cabbage and they go, hey, this is my space. No, it's my space. And they start, they start crowding in on each other. And they don't do well with resources. This is why if you've ever weeded your garden, and look at your garden two or three days after it's been weeded. It's like all the plants have grown by a couple of inches. They're like, oh, I can breathe. So they're not fighting for resources. Why did people used to space stop three feet apart? And people say, well, it's because of tractors, because of evil big ag. Now we can grow in a tiny box that only costs $49.99 and you put the fertilizer packet in it. Yeah, no, there's more than that. They say, well, you can go back a little further. Well, they did that because they had plows. You know, they, they had to have a way to get the mule through. It's part of it. Did they have hoses back then that they could run behind their house? No hoses. They couldn't put the sprinklers on. Why did they space them so wide? Limited resources. You can grow with just the rainfall, in some cases, some vegetables, some plants that are well suited to Florida, black-eyed bees, collards. You plant after a good rainfall and you give them enough space, they will just find their own way. I had a collard that accidentally escaped my garden. I had fed some stuff to the goats and things, and somehow a collard ended up at one corner over here where I'd had a, uh, a goat for a while, and it was just by itself. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and here I was trying to be real smart and plant all my stuff in my little raised beds, and that collard over there turned into this big monster. It's like six foot long, and it's curling along the ground. It fell over, and it kept coming up, it fell, and it kept going. It actually survived two years before it finally gave up. Why did it do that? I left it alone. It had tons of space. It wasn't fighting with other colors. So sometimes it's a matter of, let's, how did they do it? Why did they do it? Like, we are not smarter than our ancestors. We may have more knowledge available to us at our fingertips, but remember that they were feeding themselves because they had to. They had to grow food. It wasn't that convenient. So if your area, was known for cows, and people had goats and chickens and that kind of stuff, but they didn't really have gardens, maybe you should have animals. If your area used to be a pecan orchard, hey man, pecans are probably going to be pretty good. What else grows with pecans? You know, you look around, what, what else grows with pecans? Well, I mean, Georgia has peanuts and uh, sweet potatoes, those are probably grow. Well, I don't know. You know, you look at why, why do we have these southern foods? It's not because they're the best foods in the world necessarily. It's just because that's what grew where it grew. So, first of all, start with stuff that likes the soil. Second of all, try to figure out how you can do it simply in ways that's not, that are not going to cost you uh, a massive amount of infrastructure. 
if it can be this green outside, you can make your garden green as well. That's my advice. Thank you. I suppose, do we have any time to take questions? Anybody have any questions? What's that? Peppers. Yes, and I have noticed that the hot peppers way outgrow my bell peppers. I've done really good with hot peppers, and my bell peppers do okay, but they're not like those hot peppers. We have so many hot peppers, we don't know what to do with them. And, and by the way, if you do want a tomato, the Everglades tomato, the native Florida tomato, it's almost like a wild tomato. I don't know if my daughter has any more seeds, but we grew them this year, and it was just ridiculous. So many of them we just gave up. Any other questions? Yes. You might have to come up. <laughs> I got flying rocks. Hello. He says he has clay and rocks. Should he sift the rocks out or what else would he do? Sometimes actually taking the rocks out makes it worse. They kind of make gaps in the clay to a certain extent. Um, the clay expands and contracts around those rocks and sometimes they actually give it pockets. Clay, the first thing you can do is chemical. And I don't mean chemical like, well you have to buy this product uh, that's you know like from NASA. Just gypsum. Gypsum causes clay to flocculate, which means to divide up, to not stick so hard. Clay soil with magnesium in it is like a rock. Gypsum makes it the opposite. It makes it crumbly. Uh, I had luck piling a huge amount of wood chips on top of a clay area. However, in Florida, sometimes the deep mulching leads to incredible pest problems too, and it's also difficult if you're going to have any kind of large area to um, to adequately cover it with material. That's why most of my gardens are not covered in mulch, because you a combination of pests, and it's not the simplest method. Just because back to Eaton works really great for Paul Gouchy doesn't mean it works really well in Florida for everybody. So <laughs> you can mechanically break it apart. If you plant a rye cover crop, rye has really good root system, and this is rye grain, not just the rye grass. If you can get rye grain and plant it over the area, that will help. It will put a lot of root channels down into it. Sometimes daikon radishes work too, but sometimes they also push their way out of the ground if they hit stuff. So you might try um, breaking it mechanically, adding gypsum to it, putting down cover crops, and seeing if it softens up a little bit. dealing with other problems such as um, climate change, can we mitigate some of that? And there's also things like pesticides and herbicides that have ended up in manures which can destroy your garden as well and make it difficult to go back to that sort of a system. I would say if you were to look at what kind of an of an ecological impact small family farms would have had 200 years ago compared to what a small family farm has an ecological impact today, it would be startling. You think, well, we're going to spray the pasture to get rid of this thing, we're going to spray the fence line for this sort of thing, we're going to run this much diesel to do this, we're going to, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And there's a lot of, of inputs and a lot of pesticides that are used. Generally, um, if you're just trying to feed yourself, the first thing you should shoot for is to feed yourself. Okay, 
So what I mean by that is the first thing you're trying to do is feed yourself. If you were to garden your backyard and use 10, 10, 10, like, you know, just throw some 10, 10, 10 down and garden in your backyard. Just by growing food in your backyard there, if you didn't spray any pesticides, you have pesticide-free produce that is locally produced and it's fresher than what you're getting in the store. Now, is that ideal? No, it's not ideal. But you're still, instead of having broccoli shipped from 1,600 miles away and all that kind of thing, you're actually producing something from your backyard. You've made a really big step just by moving into growing food. And then from beyond there, you say, okay, well now if I, if I made my own compost, maybe I'll go and get some seaweed and I'll, I'll get some wood chips uh, from the tree company and I'll mix it up in the backyard and I'll, I'll grow on compost. Well, now I'm not using any chemical fertilizer. So now I've eliminated another input that was probably made with fossil fuels, trucked across the country, et cetera. And now I'm also not gonna have potential runoff issues if there's water that's running out of the yard and it's not gonna put phosphorus into the local pond, that sort of thing. So you can make another step over. And then you say, okay, well, I wonder if I could, um, if I could add a couple of animals to this and maybe we could cycle some of those vegetables and then we could take the manure of the chickens and then we could feed them and now we've got like, then we could get eggs. We could have like, we don't have to, have this horrible factory farm with this big horrible cages and stuff. I can't afford to go buy the farm eggs from down the road, so I'm gonna raise a couple of chickens. So you could, you kind of move as you can and don't get paralyzed by the fact that you can't do it right. Because this is a this is a fallen, broken world. It was created perfect, it's not perfect anymore. Because we're in it. And we all are hypocrites, and we're all screwed up. We are all broken inside. And it, no matter how hard we try, we can't do it that great. You know, if you, even if you're like really nice to a lady crossing the street, right? The old lady's crossing the road. That's the terror series. I'm going to walk that lady across the street. And people see me. Hey, just walking this lady across the street. See how good I am? We can't even do a good thing without feeling about, you know, like, <laughs> look at I kind of. I recycled that plastic bottle. Saved a turtle today. You know, it's difficult. It's difficult to balance the, I want it perfect. We want it perfect. And I want to do the very best I can. I don't want to have any, this, this horrible, the cruelty to animals is ugly. The poison in the manure is ugly. I want to do it as best as I can on my own land. And you do it one piece at a time. And then hopefully you encourage some other people to say, hey, let's, Let's be good stewards of this. And many of those older ways, they did make mistakes. And we can look and say, okay, the Dust Bowl was a definite mistake. You don't till up grasslands in a low rainfall area. That's a bad idea. Because the roots are the only thing keeping that dust in the ground. And everybody's gonna end up in California. And you know how that turns out. <laughs> so you, can, you, you take it one piece at a time. And do your very and do your very best. And the the I have written many times about the herbicides and manure. That is a terrible problem. Every time you're dealing with the remnants and the destruction left by big agriculture, it's sickening. I mean, it's sickening that you're safer feeding your garden with Miracle Grow than you are with getting manure from the horses down the road. How many thousands of years have people used horse manure from down the road and it was just fine? Now you put it on. Oh, they sprayed the field for spiny pigweed, and so all the manure twists your plants up. I must have had, I've had hundreds of people say, David, what happened to my garden? Ah, I know what that is. You did things exactly as best as you could, and you got screwed by the system. That hurts, and it makes you feel sick. But you just have to go, you know, day after day and do your best. Any other questions? Who is that? Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I'm so happy to uh, all join you all.
It's been very nice to be back in the United States. We were overseas for some years, and, and I'm, I'm very glad to be back. I do have some of my books over there. My daughter's running the table, and she has a little seed company, so she has a few seeds over there, too. Uh, and you can find me on YouTube. I try to answer emails and comments as I get them. I'm not the best at it. I'm kind of slow sometimes because I get a lot. But um, if I can help you in Florida, if there's anything you need, you know, catch me here, drop me an email. You can find me. I'm all over the internet. Just look for David the Good. And uh, may God bless you all. Your thumbs always be green.